Okay, bro, Steph here uh, once again uh, with Prophecy Insights. Uh, sorry that the the broadcast I was doing, the screen flipped, and uh, I lost the positioning of the screen, but uh, we're back now. Um, so I was talking about the title of uh, today's broadcast is the stages being set for the conqueror or the man of sin, the Antichrist. And I, I want to explain why I think that. Okay, number one, uh, Israel is experiencing problems with Iran and Israel is seriously discussing uh, the need to uh, very possibly um, try to do away with Iran's nuclear installations. That's on their drawing board, and they're, they're serious about it. They have to be, because Israel is concerned that if Iran decides, uh, good evening, Deborah, thank you for being here. If Iran decides um, to launch a nuclear attack on Israel's Demona uh, nuclear installation, you know, it only takes one nuclear missile to get through. And so Israel's really concerned about that. Next, we have Israel discovering yet another oil and natural gas um, concentration. Uh, so, you know, I mean... It seems like every time Israel has a new gas, natural gas oil find, it's another 500 years or more uh, that that natural gas and oil find will be able to last at least 500 years for Israel. So at this point, I think Israel has three or four um fields out there that they're mining oil and natural gas. So they're, you know, they've got enough to last them 2,000 years. Um, and so this has got Russia nervous. And let me explain to you why. Not many people are talking about this, but Israel has signed a cooperative agreement. I think I mentioned this two videos ago that I did. You can go to my YouTube uh, uh, or just go to brosteph.com, scroll down the page, and you'll see my YouTube playlist. So you can see which video uh, where I talked about this. But... Um, Israel uh, is serious about getting natural gas shipped out through Egypt up to the European Union. And Egypt and Israel has formed an agreement uh, to make that happen. Now, how they're going to develop that pipeline. We don't know if it'll be done through trucks. We don't know yet really uh, how Israel's going to get that done. It might be kind of like our Keystone pipeline was above ground. And, um, you know, they just send it up to Egypt. Egypt sends it to the European Union. Well, Russia's very nervous about this. The reason why is because it will cut into Russia's revenue stream. 
Uh, Russia makes most of their revenue through oil and natural gas that they sell to Europe. They're now holding Europe hostage by saying we're not going to turn the spigots on as heavily as we have in the past. And so now Europe is facing down a very cold winter and people not having enough uh, natural gas uh, or oil to fuel to create heat in their homes. And so this is becoming a real big problem. Uh, so we have that tension uh, between Russia and Israel. It's not talked about that much, but it exists because uh, Israel wants to help as much as she can. That's just in the nature of the Jews and Israel. Uh, the Holocaust taught the Jews, myself included, I'm Jewish, my family's Jewish. It taught us how to be concerned about other, other people's uh, plight in life. Because uh, the Jewish people remember when they were in need and when life was very difficult for the Jewish people. And so there's this inbred sense within the Jewish community to help out underprivileged countries, underprivileged people, or people who are struggling um, in this life. Uh, so it's, it's inbred in the Jewish psyche to reach out. S specifically, uh, Germany is going to be hit really hard uh, this winter. The, they just don't have the wherewithal to keep their homes uh, warm. Um, and it's going to be real cold over there this winter. So that's a concern. Okay, we have Iran on Israel's northern border that has its proxies threatening to encroach itself on Israel's northern border. Israel can't let that happen. We have Chi of China, who has just been reelected. Some are saying, and I believe this to be true, that in a couple of years, he'll probably end up being the emperor of China, having a lifetime office as emperor. And a lot believe that either the end of this year, which is coming up very quickly, or sometime next year in 2023, latest 2024, China is going to take over Taiwan. Now, they're not going to do it with conventional warfare. They have other means where they can strangle off uh, uh, choke points, create choke points where Taiwan won't be able to get the resources they need to take care of their people. And by making it difficult on them, food, etc., electricity, uh, all these kinds of things, natural resources to run a country. If China can choke that off, then they believe they'll be able to convince the Taiwanese to yield to China, and China will then be in control of Taiwan just like she did with Hong Kong. Remember when China moved into Hong Kong and the Brits surrendered Hong Kong to China. China, oh, we're going to let the people remain free. The people will be able to live life just as they always have. Yeah. Try to get into Hong Kong now. Um, the people in Hong Kong are not 
free like they were under the British. So we got that issue that is is now concerning um, a lot of people. Interesting that, again, that isn't being talked about that much either. Um, then, you know, we have wars and rumors of wars happening all over the globe. In the United States, we have unrest in Iran, the Iranian people are rising up and want the mullahs out. In the EU, there are protests, there are infightings going on in Europe over the lack of, or let me put it this way, over inflationary costs on food. And um, so we, we have these kinds of issues happening in the United States. People are just now starting to feel the inflationary costs of food. In the United States, we're feeling it right now. It's starting to squeeze our, our budgets uh, in the U.S. And the more inflation starts to bear down on us in the States, the more you're going to see the American people complain and get upset just like what's going on in Europe right now. Um, so what we have is the scenario that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. We have, in the United States right now, we have kids shooting down, beating up senior citizens or other young people being shot and murdered by young people. And we have lawlessness, we have drug abuse, we have all, we have the illegal immigration issue in the United States. Without borders, you're not a country. And our borders are, for all intents and purposes, our borders are gone in the U.S. People are flooding in like never before. <clears throat> if you look at the Texas borders, Del Rio, Texas, I mean, it's just a sieve where people can walk in, claim political asylum, and remain in the U.S. under the Biden administration. So we've got unrest. We've got uncertainty, just like Jesus talked about. We've got um, anarchy, and it's, it's getting out of hand worldwide, just not in the United States, just not in Europe, but everywhere. It's spreading like wildfire. The Lord told us in Matthew 24, he warned us that the great tribulation would come when the man of sin comes into power and he marches into the temple, the Holy of Holies, of the third temple that's going to be built. They, you know, we all think, or not we, I shouldn't say we all, but the Jews think that that's going to be the temple for the coming Messiah. That coming Messiah will be the false Messiah. Uh, and he's going to go into the Holy of Holies, declare himself to be God, just like Jesus said he would do. And then the wrath of God will begin falling on the world immediately, according to Matthew 24. That's how you know in the Great Tribulation, that's the final three years of human rule on this earth. 
The way you know when that begins is when the Antichrist goes in the temple and says, I'm God. Then the final, that great tribulation uh, that Joel and uh, Jeremiah talk about, that's going to ensue and it's going to be just horrible. It's going to be like nothing that's ever happened in human history. So, today I took a look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. And let me just read that to you, and then I'll have a comment or two. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering to conquer. What's missing from that king's weaponry? What? Did the Bible not say he had? Answer? He had no quiver of arrows. He had just a bow. He had no ammunition. No arrows. So this depicts the man of sin that Daniel talked about, uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, where <clears throat> he's a big mouth. He has no royalty. He is a politician, more than likely. And Daniel said he, would, he spoke pompous words and, and made promises that he was never going to be able to keep. But isn't that what politicians do? Just look at today. The politicians of today don't know how to tell the truth. They flower everything up with fancy language, and they lie, look right in the camera and lie to everybody. I don't care what country they're in. They're all doing the same thing now. They lie to keep their power and their authority. The Antichrist is going to do that in spades. And it's interesting, isn't it? Without any arrows, without any ammunition but his mouth, and his intellect and his ability to deceive and manipulate people, he goes out conquering and to conquer. Because the nations begin following the man of sin, the Antichrist. He's going to have so much charisma, and he's going to be so eloquent in his thinking and what he says, people are going to believe that he's God come to earth. They're going to worship this guy. I believe, and here was the purpose of this video today, I believe we are seeing the stage for the Antichrist is being set. The foundation is being set right now. I believe it started with 9-11, then the COVID, and now it's just, they're just, really tightening down the thumb screws on everybody. And right now in the United States, there are people that have been arrested for peaceful protests at abortion clinics. And an 85-year-old believer in Jesus Christ, a woman, 85 years old, was arrested by the FBI. Our First Amendment rights to free speech are being attacked in the United States. If it's happening here, 
you know it's happening around the globe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I believe that the, again, I'll repeat it, the foundation of the man of sin, the Antichrist, is being laid out right now. Now, we don't know how long it's going to take to complete that foundation, setting the stage, but it certainly is happening at a high rate of speed right now. I mean, just, you just have to look around. I mean, there are pastors that have been put in jail in the United States. Whistleblowers to the Hunter Biden laptop, people that have got factual information about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden have disappeared. No one knows where they're at. They just disappear. Poof, gone. Where are they? No one knows. And so that's what the Antichrist is going to do when he's in power. If you disagree with him, he'll lop your head off or just have you killed somehow, some way. That's what's coming in the future. Now, how long in the future? I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be just a couple of years or if it's going to be 10 or 20 more years to get his, his foundation set to where he can rule and reign. Personally, right now, the technologies we have in place make it possible for an Antichrist figure to rule over the entire globe to keep track of every single human being on this planet. That technology now exists, and they're toying around and playing around with chips being put into the body that can be connected to the brain that a central supercomputer can tell if you're sick, if you need medical care, uh, can track you. And they're toying around with the concepts of, of shutting off certain parts of your thinking processes and only allowing other processes to work. They're actually toying around with this stuff. Now, how far is God going to allow that to go? I don't think he's going to let it go very far. Why do I say that? Look what he did with the Tower of Babel. You know, they start building this tower, and the, the, the uh, attitude behind building the tower is they wanted to be like God. God leveled it and then dispersed people all over the globe. And everyone spoke a different language. I don't think God's going to allow mankind to toy around with his creation, that is, human beings, to that extent for very long. I, I think God's going to lower the hatchet on that and stop it. Stop it how? By allowing the great tribulation, the judgment of the entire globe, the judgment of all unbelievers to come. Again, when? I can't tell you that. But it looks like to me that it's getting closer and closer and things are developing so fast. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I was thinking the other day, just go back. 15 years and some of the things we we see on TV and and that our our kids are being introduced to you'd be put in prison 15 years ago if you allowed a transsexual transvestite to strip in front of kindergartners 
or to to try to encourage children, young kids, five years old to 10 years old, to be, you know, to change their sex. You'd be put in jail for committing a perversion and for committing child abuse against these kids. And now they're doing it in libraries. They're doing it in schools. They're just going, hey, what's wrong with that? And the adults clap. The adults are in, you, you can see it on YouTube. Watch these videos. They just clap. Yeah, that's so good. And everyone's laughing, having a good old time. Well, everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah was having a good old time until the Lord lowered the boom and sulfur got rained down on them and rocks on fire got rained down on them. They were having a good old time until God said, I'm done with it. And he brought them to a quick end. And one day they were over. In just a few hours, done. And that's where we're headed. We're headed, if sin is allowed to run rampant and get worse, like we're seeing, then where we're headed is God's going to stop it. How? Through the great tribulation. He'll bring it all to an end. And just before the world is going to be totally annihilated and wiped out completely, just before that, Jesus will return and start his thousand-year millennial kingdom. One thousand years of Jesus our Savior, ruling and reigning over planet Earth, bringing peace, joy, mercy, salvation to everyone. That's where we're headed. That's where it's all going. That's the end point. And then everything in between that is God beginning to judge people for rejecting his son. That's what we're saying. The reason the world is turning so wicked is because they hate God. Just read Romans chapter 1. It God outlines it item by item by item in Romans chapter 1. Just read it. Read the book of Thessalonians, Thessalonians 1 and 2. God outlines everything that people are doing, item by item by item. And he says, it's for these reasons I have to judge man, and I have to bring the destruction of things there has to be a tribulation, a great tribulation. It's going to be so bad, it's going to make the Holocaust look like kindergartners were created. The Holocaust that's coming is going to be so pervasive and so serious and so bad that Jesus said, if I don't return... It will wipe out man and the earth completely. So, how long do we have? Uh, no one knows. But to me, it looks like, like I said, the foundation of the Antichrist is being put in place now. And I believe that's going to continue until the Antichrist comes to power. Now, there's a discussion, and I'll leave you with this. There's been this ongoing debate amongst believers. It's been going on since I've been a believer. I, I came to know the Lord in 1975. The debate has been, 
will the rapture of the church, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, will the rapture of the church happen before the Great Tribulation? The final seven years of Daniel's 70th week, that's the final seven years of mankind's governmental power over this earth, okay? Will the rapture happen before that seven-year period, or will the rapture happen after the Antichrist, or just before the Antichrist goes into the temple and declares himself to be God? Now, here's why that debate has gone on for years. When you look at Noah, or not Noah, but Lot, and you look at what happened there with Lot, things were so bad in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family had to be almost drug out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the angels that God sent, two angels that God sent to rescue them. They had to grab Lot and his family by their hands and drag them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel said, we have to go. The destruction of this place is coming. And God can't hold it back forever. So let's go and get out of here. It's coming today. I, we've got to get you out of here. And so they drug him out, got him to safety, and then immediately, when, when Lot and his family were safe, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah fell immediately. Let's look at Noah. Noah had preached for 120 years. Some believe it was 100 years. Some believe it was 120 years. Let's just say, for sake of argument, it was 120 years. So Noah's preaching for 120 years to the people of his day who were very wicked. Wickedness was everywhere. And, and God was so upset with Noah's generation because why? Because angels that fell with Lucifer had sex with the human women of that day and tried to corrupt the gene pool of humanity thinking Satan's thought was, if I can corrupt the genetic gene pool, then God will wipe everybody out and there won't be a Messiah because the whole seed of man's been corrupted. Well, Noah, his family was not corrupted. That's why God said that he was... He was the only righteous man living at the time. Well, does that mean righteous in that he was a perfect man? No, we're all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. What it meant is what God was trying to say in that scripture in Genesis is that Noah, his family line remained pure where the Demonic angels did not infiltrate his bloodline. That's why God was able to set Noah aside. So now Noah is set aside. He builds the ark. He preaches to the people of his day what the ark is for and what's coming. They didn't believe him. God says to Noah, get you and your family in the ark. The Bible says the Lord shut the door. Not Noah. The Lord shut the door behind him and sealed it and it was locked and it couldn't be opened. Once the door was shut, the chance of salvation was over. All the other people would have had to do is say, we believe what you're preaching, Noah, can we come on the ark with you? Go on the ark. They would have been saved too. No way. They didn't believe it. Noah and his family 
The minute they went into that ark, that door was closed and sealed by God. What happened? The rain started falling. The, the water started coming down. The boat started to lift up. And then the waters in the deep under the foundations of the earth cracked open. And water gushed out from below the the crust of the earth, the dirt in the earth. And mountains started popping up. And God changed the whole topography of the globe. The minute Noah went into that ark with his family, judgment came. That's why the debate of the rapture. A lot believe, I'm one of them, this is my belief, that just before the Antichrist goes into the temple to declare himself to be God, just before that happens, the rapture will come. The believers will be removed. And then the man of sin will make his declaration, and the judgment of God falls immediately. And there will be seven judgments a year for three years, that's 21 in all, will fall on planet Earth over a three-year period. That's why it's going to be hell on Earth. Just read Revelation chapter 6 through 19, you'll see what all the judgments are, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, the seal judgments. You'll see how terrible they are. And that's why Jesus said, if I didn't cut that time short, all humanity would be wiped out. That's why it can't be a seven-year Great tribulation. Jesus marked it. He set the, the time sequence for us in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination that makes desolate, don't turn around to get your go bag. Don't get blankets. Don't get your clothing. Don't get food. Run as fast as you can and get out of Jerusalem and go to the mountains. That's what the Lord told his people that are alive then to do. Because great tribulation is coming like the world has never seen. So, we're going to find out. One day we're going to find out if the rapture of the church happens at the beginning of the seven years or does it happen in the middle of the seven years? We're going to find out. But in either case, in either case, it's nothing to argue about. It's not, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour of my coming. We don't know. The calendar is so messed up that it's impossible to know. You know, we say we're in, in 2022. It could be 2025, and we wouldn't know it. The calendar is that messed up. Over the years, we, the calendar's just been mess, messed up. And then you've got daylight savings, and you don't have daylight savings. Then you have a leap year, and then messed up. During the Dark Ages, it really got messed up, too. So, if you don't know the Lord, let's wrap this up. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please, please, I beg you, I plead with you, go to my website, brosteph.com. And scroll down toward the bottom of that page, and it says how to start your relationship with Jesus. And I've got some helpful tools there. Everything's free of charge, no charge. 
Freely God has given to me and freely I share with you. But if you don't know the Lord, ask him into your life today and read Romans chapter 10, John 3, 16 through 18. Get familiar with it. Start reading your Bible. It's the manufacturer's handbook. Who among us would try to work on their car without the ha manufacturer's handbook right next to you? Okay, the Bible's God's handbook and directions to us. And then if there's a home Bible study or a church near you that preaches the word of God, all of it, that doesn't cut 30% of the, the biblical record out, because, you know, prophecy makes up 30% of the Bible. But if you can find a church or a home Bible study where the whole Bible is preached and the Bible is taken literally, that's where you want to be. But you ask Jesus into your life and you just make confession to him. Just tell him you're sorry for the things you've done that has hurt and offended him and the things you've done to hurt the people around you. That's all you got to do. I'm sorry for what I did to hurt you. Look, when I asked Christ into my life in 1975, God had me sit at a table six months after I did that, sit at the kitchen table, and he had me write out on a yellow pad, legal pad, everybody that I hurt or offended or sinned against. It was like three pages of people. And then I wrote their phone numbers, <coughs> excuse me, to the right of the name. The Lord told me, made it very clear to me, I want you to go and either see them or call them on the phone. But you must contact them, and I want you to tell them what I've done in your life and how sorry you are for what you did to hurt them or to let them down or whatever the case may have been. God wanted me to take personal ownership of my sin. And then consequences, the consequence of that sin is I had to face them. And God used this. I did this in two days. I was done in two days. I went after it. I attacked that list like it. my life depended on it. And in two days, I was done. The burden was lifted up off my shoulder. And I felt like I was a new creation in God. My life started to change instantly. Very quickly, people who knew me, my wife's parents, etc., they could see that changes were occurring in me that were unbelievable to them, that I was becoming a new creation. Romans chapter 12 was happening in my mind and heart, the renewing of my mind and my spirit and the way I thought, and the way I believed, and the way I acted, things started to change rapidly. Then my older brother asked Jesus into his life, my brother Gary. And so it, that's how it went. Now, have I sinned since then? <laughs> of course I have. I'm one of the chief sinners, like Paul said, I'm a chief sinner. There's nothing good in me. My righteousness is as filthy rags. That's in the book of Isaiah. There's nothing good in me. The only good thing in me is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, his spirit in me. That's the only good thing in me. And he helps me to do 
the will of God. That's why I do these videos. I do these videos because God's asked me to encourage you to be an encourager. And so the information I shared today, though it might be a little scary up front, the, the encouragement is this. Jesus has got it all under control. This world's not out of control as far as he's concerned. It's doing exactly what he wants it to do so that the time will come when the rapture will occur and believers will be removed and the Lord's second coming will occur and peace will then fall and reign over planet Earth. He's got it all under control. None of this surprises him. He, he's known this was all going to happen and the way it was going to happen. It's following his prescribed program. That's just the way it is. We serve a God that knows it all. Nothing escapes him. You might as well tell him the truth, how much of a sinner you are, because he already knows it. He died to set you free from that sin. So ask him into your life today. Just put this on pause. Pause it. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong in my life. Forgive me of my sin and help me to walk with you. I believe that you are the son of the living God who was born who died on that cross for my sin, who was buried and three days later was resurrected to life, I believe in you with all of my heart. He'll save you. If that's in your heart, Romans chapter 10, if a man makes confession with his mouth, and believes in his heart that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul said, the Apostle Paul, he will be saved. That's it. God bless you. I'll see you again soon. Share this with people. Comment, good or bad. I'm open to all of it. But um, if you found something encouraging in this broadcast, then please just pass it on to a friend. I would really appreciate it. See you again soon. Bro Steph, over and out. Bye for now.